Hey, thanks for being here this morning. My name is Andrea Smith. I have the privilege of being the pastor here at West, and happy first Sunday after Easter. We are starting a new message series today. It is on prayer. And so um, if you have your cell phones with you and you brought them inside, I would like for you to get them out. And during this next song, I'd actually like to hear from you. Back in the fall, we did a message series called Deconstructing Religion. And what we looked at were some of the things that that we struggle with about spirituality and religion. We talked about some of those things in the series. For the next several weeks, we're going to be talking about prayer. And it's one of those topics that's really hard to understand. I don't have all the answers, so I'll go on and lay that out to you right now. Uh, but what my role is as your pastor is to help you to, to have information, scriptural information, theological information. That's a big word for the study and understanding of God. And so I want to know, what do you wrestle with with prayer? I'm not going to say, oh, you know, well, Greg said or Laura said. I'm not going to, like, call you out in just a minute. But it will help me know, first of all, like, sort of where the conversation goes today. But in the subsequent weeks, some of the topics that you wrestle with. And online folks, I've asked that in the chat room. Thank you for putting your responses. And I hope you'll continue to do this. This is the number on the screen behind me or to the sides of me in chat room or online people you'll see it on your screen. This is the number I want you to text it to. This is my work number. This is the cell number that if you ever need me, this is the one you use. The other uh, number that you get texts from, that's our text messaging service. And so I hope you get those texts in an ongoing manner. I hope you got one this morning telling you about worship. If you didn't, stop at the VIP tent out front. Give them your number. It's important for us to stay connected and stay in community. So we want to make sure you're a part of that messaging system. But while the team sings the next song in just a few minutes, I want you to let me know what are your questions about prayer. Uh, the message series, it's called Left Unread. Don't you hate it when you send a text message to somebody and they show you their read receipts and they never read your message? I mean, that is like such a a smack in the face, like, I don't want to hear from you anymore. And if you're old like me, that you may not even understand anything I just said. Uh, but I know from our younger staff that it's a very real thing, and most of the people on this stage. So, if you're new to West, we're really glad that you chose to be here. We're a missional church, and we seek to give ourselves away. That's a part of who we are and what we're about. We'd love to know that you were here, so stop by the VIP tent out front. Same as if you are worshiping with us online and you're new newer to our community, let us know that so we can send you a thank you gift in the mail and a thank you for being here. We have some guests that are going to be worshiping with us in person next week. Uh, you're going to be hearing a good bit about this in the news over the next couple of weeks, this thing called General Conference. It's when all the United Methodists from all over the world gather together every four years. The last one was postponed because it was in 2020, and that was the year that uh, the world sort of stopped because of COVID. And so this is the first General Conference that we've had in, in a long time. And and it's uh, when we look at our governing rules, we look at our theological principles, we write our language of what we believe and how we live and how we want to be as United Methodists. And so our conference is actually one of the hosts because this year's general conference is in Charlotte. And so some missionaries from the denomination there were three churches that they could choose for them to go to, and they asked us to host them. So it's a big deal. So number one, please come to church uh, next Sunday or the next Sunday and sit here in the little blue fuzzy chairs if you have that opportunity. Uh, we want to show them that... Uh, we exist and we're real. Uh, but other than that, I really don't know what to expect yet. I'll figure that out in the next couple of days, I hope. But uh, we'll just introduce them next Sunday in worship. And then uh, it was funny. They're like, have them participate in your liturgy, which we don't have any. Uh, have them go to your Sunday school class. And I'm like, we don't have any of that either. So um, I'm not real sure what we're going to do on week two, but we'll do something. But it was an honor that they chose us. Uh, there were lots and lots of other churches they could have gone to. Um, I'm not sure why they picked us, but I want to believe it's because we're missional. So uh, I look forward to seeing you in worship, hint, hint, next Sunday. And uh, thank you for being here. Let me know what you wrestled with about prayer. Today's going to be uh, a different kind of sermon, so um, buckle up. 
How many of you know what ball game that was? Clap. How many of you have no clue? Okay, a few of you. Don't be embarrassed about that. We're not all basketball people. It's, it's all good. And I am like marginally, some people really like it when I talk about sports because it's afternoon entertainment because they can laugh about how bad I massacre them. In fact, like out in the hallway, I'm like, yeah, the bumper video today is the game between UConn and Iowa State. And Luann's like, no, no, it is not Iowa State. It is Iowa. I'm like, okay, who knew? So um, I'm really glad she actually told me that. So I didn't look too stupid. A few years ago, we were, it was Christmas Eve, and I said that they were playing uh, water lacrosse, and um, people were very kind that evening, and then a few texted me later and said, there's no such thing. It's called water polo. I'm like, oh, okay, well, there you go. So there are some things I don't know, and prayer is something that I practice. It's something that I believe in, However, uh, we've been taught so many things about prayer if we've grown up in the church or around church people. And so what I'm going to ask us to do today and in the next several weeks is to sort of maybe take a step back from what we've always understood to be true about prayer. And I'm going to help us look at this through the eyes of of scholars and other theologians, people who study scripture and the context in which it's written, and their words about prayer and what it is, it involves us thinking about our own per- perceptions and understandings. It also understands, uh, requires us to think about our own understanding of God and what God is. That's why the opening video of worship this morning was Bruce Almighty. And and thinking about God in that way, that is not God. Uh, God is not a big person on a big throne that sits up in the heavens. That is not God. That is our understanding of God. That like he's this big guy with a long white beard and a lot of power. That is that is not God. Jesus came and walked on earth. We believe that Jesus was and is the the son of God. We celebrate in this Easter season a resurrected Jesus that he appeared again to them and his presence and his energy was around them and with them and Jesus taught them before he was before he ascended to the Father and and back during his life, he's like, look, everything that I do and everything that I am doing, you can do and so much more. So Jesus did some pretty cool things. He healed people and he lived through the most horrific circumstances and he came out fully whole and fully alive in a new way, in a new form. And so there's got to be a way that that can happen to us too because he said that it would And one of the ways that we can understand that is through prayer. Now, uh, I asked you to share with me some of your concerns and and I'm really, or questions or thoughts around prayer. And I'm really grateful for the responses that we've gotten. Today, we are actually going to talk about when we pray and how we pray. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at the Lord's Prayer. It's like the goat of all prayers, right? Jesus taught people to pray that prayer. And so hopefully that'll answer some of our questions about prayer. But there are so many misconceptions around it. And if we if we live into those misconceptions and we don't address them, then we get this really bad idea of God. And we think that God is like some arbitrary person that's like up there giving some people what they want and what they pray for and other people not. Um, I guarantee you if I were to ask, which I'm not, but if I were to ask us to clap uh, for those of us who have had unanswered prayers, we would all, if we've prayed long enough in our lives, we would have encountered an unanswered prayer. Now, all prayer we believe, is answered. God hears and answers all prayers. But perhaps the answer is not what we want. Perhaps the answer is not what we understand. Years ago when I was the associate pastor and I was so new to ministry at Williamson's Chapel, we had a lady who had just been diagnosed. She had she had breast cancer and it was in remission for a very short amount of time and then it came back and it had already spread to her brain. 
And she's like, why does God not hear my prayer? And I had the privilege of mentoring under, uh, with the senior pastor and being with him and her in that experience. And she's like, I'm praying for healing. And the senior pastor said, we're going to pray for bold miracles. We're going to absolutely pray for a physical miracle. But we also are going to understand that healing comes in lots of ways. That phrase has stuck with me forever. Healing comes in a lot of ways. And if we are people that believe in the power and the presence of the resurrection, then we believe that ultimately our healing is when we are at one with God and perfect peace. So the same lady, weeks later, we were visiting her again. She had just gotten back from the oncologist at Baptist, and the cancer had spread. She had multiple brain tumors, and she was telling us about her conversation with her oncologist. And so I'm getting ready to tell you that story to say, also, at the end of today's message and throughout, I'm going to share with you some personal stories of things that I have seen happen in real people's lives. And I don't understand them, okay? And sometimes these things that have happened, that I've seen happen, they have caused me to think that I am crazy. Now, I know that I'm a little odd and unique and different sometimes, but, you know, like, I mean, weird woo-woo stuff. And those things over the last 15 years to 20 years that have happened in my life and, and in my ministry They've caused me to really wrestle with this thing called prayer. Like I just, I don't understand it. But I understand it enough to know that it's real and it matters. In the beginning in Genesis, when we read both of the creation stories, remember there's two of those. It's not just God said, I want the world to come into existence, and then in seven days, voila, it happened. There's two different creation stories. We have to understand how we look at Scripture. We look at Scripture as the divine, inspired Word of God. As recorded by man, it is human story, inspired and we also believe that God did not stop speaking to human beings a couple of thousand years ago. And we also don't believe that God only taught to the few that wrote some stuff down. There are people, leaders in our society now, Richard Rohr is one of those, that are the most profound studiers of the words of God. And when they write things and produce things, I mean, we believe that those things are divine and inspired as well. And they give us so much insight into things such as prayer. You know, back a ton of years ago, they thought the world was what? Say, sit, tell me. They thought the world was flat, right? Now, they figured out that it isn't, correct? Yes. So science continued to develop, and they began to understand things in a new way. Well, how many of you, I do want you to clap for this, and sorry, chat room, I can't see your responses, but how many of you, I want you to clap, understand quantum physics? Do any of you? I mean, I'm not being sarcastic or rude right now. I really, I need to know. Okay. It is a real field of science. And our kids that are going through school right now and, and middle school and high school, they're going to learn about quantum physics when they get to high school and they take their, their high school science classes. We did not. None of us in this room clearly have studied quantum physics Tom, my, my partner, uh, he minored in physics. And I've been studying for this message all for months, actually. But yesterday, I waited till the last minute. I'm like, hey, I really need to have a conversation with you. And his eyes get big because he's scared we're going to talk emotional stuff, and he prefers not to do that. And um, I'm like, I need you to explain to me quantum physics. He's like, now? And I'm like, yes, now. He's like, do you know how many years ago? I'm like, I just need to understand, like, about fractals. He's like, Andrea, oh, my gosh, I cannot explain that to you right now. And I'm like, but it matters. So I want you to take your spiritual hat, your religious hat, your understanding of God hat, and I want you to put it right here for just a minute. And now I want us to come over here, and I want us to be scientists for just a second. 
One of the things that I think is so powerful about actually this faith community is that you, you get it and you get that the two do not have to be separate, that we can talk about science and religion and spirituality all in one. There is a new field of science that was discovered in the early 1900s. And in the last, you know, 100 plus years, or thousand, actually, thousand, no, hundred, sorry, duh. And actually, the last hundred years, people have discovered so much more more about it and early it was called like new age stuff and and all that but it has validity back when we were in science class we studied the the atom and we studied protons and neutrons and electrons clap with me if you've heard of those things protons neutrons and electrons see you've heard of that but now there's so much more what they've discovered is that and that's not all that exist in an atom, that there are actually smaller, smaller particles, and that's what quantum means, the study of the smallest particles. And what they've discovered in this science is that things matter is not always the same, like it can have dual properties. And in a few minutes, I'm going to show you a video that explains a little more about that. But, but what it tells us is that energy exists. And that the way that we think and the actions that we take, it manipulates energy. It's weird. And it's stuff I don't understand. But it's also very real. And it is a part of our existence today. So I just want us to be open-minded enough to think about that there is something, there is some energy, some presence that exists in this world that when we think... And prayer is, prayer is a, a state of being. I want to show you, these are two uh, quotes from Richard Rohr. Prayer is a life stance. It is living in the presence. It is living in awareness of the presence. So prayer is like who we are and where we are in life. We believe that God exists in all things, that God's not some far away outer being, just a person far away. We believe that God is this divinity, this power. And remember, we are trying to put very human words about something that is not human. But we want to understand it. Because it is something that ties to our faith and it is something that actually holds it all together when the worst things are happening to us. And so we want to understand it. We want to be able to hold on to it. So in order to do that, we have to understand what God is. And God is, period. Remember we talked about during the season of Lent, the weeks leading up to Easter, where Jesus, where Jesus said, I am. And we talked about how in the Hebrew scriptures, some people like Moses and, and others that God would reveal God's self to. And when they were trying to understand who God was, God just said, I am. I am. God exists in our very breath. God exists in each of us. In every being, every living being, the presence of God, the divinity of God exists and what quantum physicists will tell you is that there is some bizarre interconnection between all things. That everything in our universe somehow is connected to one another. It's fascinating. Jesus taught a lot about prayer. I want you to hear what he said in Matthew and there's, there's lots of different times that he says another thing. Like uh, there's one time in Matthew where he talks about, you know, like if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, which that was like this tiny, tiny, tiny little thing. If you have faith that big, it will move mountains. Now, does that mean that if you pray hard enough, this mountain is going to literally pick up and move? Absolutely not. Jesus spoke in hyperboles. He used exaggeration and, and not just about prayer and everything. He did it to make a point. There's another place in scripture where he says, if two or more of you are gathered together, then God will hear your prayers and God will answer your prayers. Well, what does that mean for the person that's praying all by themselves? Does it mean that God's not going to answer that person? No. 
When we look at that passage that Jesus was talking to, he was talking to them about how to get along with one another because, frankly, they weren't. And he's like, no, I need to talk to you about what it means to be in community and relationship. And and when you're in relationship, when you're in community together and you pray, there is power in that. There is community in that. Years ago, before I was going before the board of ordained ministry the first time for ordination as a deacon, um, I was really nervous. My role at Williamson's Chapel, where we were born out of, was as the associate pastor. Uh, one of my jobs was minister of congregational care. And in, we had very formal worship services, not like this. And so right before the song where they passed the offering plates, we would do the prayers of the people. And early, early in the days, we would read the prayer list, which was honestly, if you are looking at my Bible right now, like the length of it in the bulletin would be about this long. And we would read all the names out loud. And then we would say, which we stopped doing because we got some weird stuff. Sometimes one person stood up and started talking about how they saw God in the toilet bowl that morning. And I was like, okay. And I would have to field these statements. It was a, it was bizarre, but I didn't want to argue with him but uh that day at the end of the prayer or at the end of the prayer request I said um I go before my ordination interview on Wednesday and I would appreciate your prayers the senior pastor at the time did not like that I did that and and he said you know are you going to be really embarrassed if you don't pass I'm like well yeah I'm also going to be devastated and they're going to wonder why I'm this blubbering mess you know because I'd worked so hard and and really wanted the ordination and blessing of the church and he's like well I just I need to understand I'm like I needed all those people to pray for me and he's like well is the prayer of one not enough I still don't know the answer to that, like, yes and no. I mean, if we believe that there's something to be said for this quantum mechanics and quantum physics and that human positivity and the way that we think manipulates matter and and all that kind of stuff, then, I mean, I don't know. But what I don't want us to think is that the prayer of one is not enough or that God doesn't answer our prayers because enough people were not praying for us because that's not the case. And so when we start discounting those things, it it requires us to go back to our understanding of God. In the creation stories where God said man has dominion over the earth, we as United Methodists, we believe in this thing called free will. It means we get to choose. We get to choose how we live our lives, and and this has been in existence from the beginning of time and humanity. And so as, as the world exists, we act and things react. Again, back to that science lesson. God is not up there or out there as like this giant vending machine and if we use our faith as a commodity we're going to get what we want it it doesn't work that way we believe that stuff happens in life bad things cells get mixed up in our bodies and and diseases happen we live in a world where Believe it or not, global warming is a real thing. And natural disasters happen more and more frequently because we are compromising the integrity of our earth. Those things happen. And in my prep for this message series, like I've listened to other pastors that I respect and and leaders in our denomination, and it's... It's really easy to become inconsistent in what we say. Like we say, God doesn't give us cancer. Or God doesn't cause us to lose our jobs so we'll learn some kind of life lesson and then get a better one. Like we don't believe God makes bad things happen to us. So if we say that, 
And we say that we believe God doesn't make bad things happen to us. But then, like we say, well, God heard my prayer and answered my prayer. I don't understand that. Because that makes God inconsistent. And the one thing that I do understand is that God is love. That's what Jesus said. That's what he pointed to. It's how he lived. He's like, look, God is love. And this statement by Richard Rohr, who is just such a brilliant theologian, he's like, prayer is a life stance when we live in that presence. And if that presence is God and God is love, then our life stance is to always be receptive and fully present in that flow, in that, in that state of being. We have a yoga church on Thursday nights at the YMCA. And yoga, it talks about the flow and the energy. That is what we understand as God. And it's good. That flow and that energy is all good. So guess what? When just stuff happens, because we live in a universe where particles and things interact and and bad things happen, that flow, that presence, that energy, it's still there. We have to be aware of it and exist in its state. That's why Rohr says we live in the presence. And we live in the awareness of the presence. When Jesus was talking to those who were following him in Matthew chapter 7, he said, Don't bargain with God. Be direct. Ask for what you need. This is not a cat and mouse hide and seek kind of game that we're in. If your child asks for bread, do you trick him with sawdust? If he asks for fish, do you scare him with a live snake on his plate? As bad as you are, you wouldn't think of doing such a thing. You're at least decent to your own children. So don't you think the God who conceived you in love will be even better? So what does that mean? And what does that mean for prayer? It means when we pray, Jesus asked for the worst thing to be taken off his plate. So we absolutely can ask for anything. Uh, You probably know maybe who Joel and Victoria Osteen are, the pastors of Lakewood Church in Texas. She went viral because she prayed for a parking spot one day, and God gave it to her. And she talked about how... um, Because she prayed and she continually prays for parking spots. I mean, you know, Jesus says ask for anything. I would encourage us to think about like asking for logical things. But as soon as we ask then being aware of are we living in the presence of love Because that presence and that energy, that is what will answer our prayers. And it's about being in that moment. And just experiencing a peace that can surpass any kind of human understanding. We're not supposed to worry about the next moment. The next moment doesn't exist. And we're not supposed to worry about the past because it's in the past. Jesus said, don't worry about tomorrow. Do you not think that the same God who cares about the birds of the air is the same God that cares about you? And God is love. Meditation, it's, it's a hot word in our society today, in our culture. That is very real. As one of the final... Sundays in the series, we will practice that. Uh, It's what Dawn Lynch, who is one of our staff people, she's so gifted in that, in that awareness of the presence. And we're going to ask her to lead us in, in a meditation in worship. But being aware and living in that presence, it helps us deal with whatever the stuff is that comes our way. I shared with you that I called Amy Coles, who was my mentor, and I said, you know, I don't know how to pray right now. Do I ask for a miracle? And she said, yes, you boldly ask for miracles. 
But what if things don't work out the way that we pray for? Then, number one, we can recognize that healing comes in a variety of ways. And we are Easter people and we believe that death is never the final answer and death is not the end. But we can also ask God, show me the way. Speak to me. Show me how you're going to use this for good because that is what we are assured of. The Apostle Paul, who said those words, who said God uses all things for good for those who love God, he had like this affliction that he prayed over and over and over again would not be a part of his life. It was his thorn in his flesh and his side, and that thorn was never removed from him. But yet he went on to say, you know, in all things give thanks and pray without ceasing. So for those of you in the in the chat room and those of you who texted, you know, like, do I have to pray at a certain time of day? No. I mean, honestly, our whole life is a prayer. It's just whether or not we are tapped into it. Our whole life is a prayer. Every breath that we take is a connection to the divine that lives within us. We are not praying or talking to someone that is out there. We are connecting. Prayer is about relationship. And it is about knowing that that love and that peace, it is inside. It is up to us to tap into it. I want us to think about, and this I know it sounds a little weird, but I really want us to stretch our understanding of God. Look at this next quote from Richard Rohr. God is an all-embracing receptor. Do me a favor. I want you to take your hands, and I want you to put them just out in front of you like this. You don't have to put them in the air or anything weird like that. I just want you to put them in front of you. The next time you don't feel like God is hearing you and you're thinking about God or praying, I want you to take this stance. Open your hands. God is like that to us. God is an all-embracing receptor. God is open and receiving us. We, too, have to receive God. And recognize, like, I don't, again, understand how God answers prayers, but we don't believe that God manipulates us, right? So when we pray for things, I've been taught and read that it doesn't necessarily change the mind of God. It changes our mind and our heart so that we can understand whatever is happening and know that God will use it somehow for good, even the most horrific things. And God can bring God's loving presence to those horrific things and help us still have what it takes in us to take one more step. If we are open to receiving. Sometimes it feels like there's just this block up. Have you ever felt that? Like there's this barrier and you're trying to talk to God and and trying to connect to God. And it's like it's just going nowhere. That's our issue. And in those moments it's just that prayer of God. I need you. There's something powerful also about bowing in prayer, like getting down, humbling ourselves, opening ourselves, becoming vulnerable to that presence and that awareness of that presence that's within us. If you find yourselves not connecting to God, go to a sacred space for you where you feel at one with nature or God Go outside, go look at the lake, go to the beach, go to the mountains, wherever your happy place is. Without distractions, you will find God in those spaces. If you cannot connect with God internally in that moment because of stuff you've got going on, allow God to use other factors and other people to be that voice of God for you. Uh, It's 1057. Time goes so fast. 
And the video that I want to show you is six minutes long, and I am not going to keep you here that long. I, I, you don't like that, and I don't want you to not like me. So um, I'm not going to, here's a little memo. I am not going to show it next week when the people from the denomination are here. I am not uh, that insane. I value job security, and it take a lot of time to understand why I'm showing a six-minute video on quantum physics and quantum mechanics. So we'll see that video three weeks from now. The takeaway from today is I want us to know that somehow there is this mystical, divine, amazing presence of love that lies within us. And sometimes things work out really good ways. And in those ways, we, we can give thanks and, and embrace that love. And sometimes things don't work out in good ways. But we can recognize that in those worst ways, that love is still there in us. And that we understand that as human beings, things come to a physical end. All human lives or mammal lives or Whatever, our lives come to a physical end, but we believe in the power of the resurrection. And we believe in the power of prayer. Two quick stories. Years ago, there was a little three-year-old girl that was in critical care. She had had to have multiple heart surgeries since she was born. And... The doctors did not give that family a good prognosis. In fact, doctors wanted to terminate the pregnancy while the mom was in the early stages. When they found this out, they said it would just be better. The family chose not to do that. They did not want to do that. So uh, the little baby was born and spent the first year of her life at Duke University Hospital. Then she was able to come home and, and spend a couple of years uh, at home, in and out of hospitals. And then they told her she was going to have to have heart surgery when she turned three. And this was about the time that the family uh, had moved to Mooresville and had started going to Williamson's Chapel. And it was just, I, I don't even have words. At that point in ministry, I'd not had to encounter young babies fighting for their lives. And it just consumed me. And I prayed for her and them all the time. Literally, it was one of those like prayers without ceasing kind of things. And I'm telling you this because it, it's, it's weird enough to take note and it's weird enough for us to know that there is something to be said for prayer and energy and the way that we think and the way that we live. It was the day after her surgery. The surgery had taken 14 hours. And, I mean, the parents were just, you can imagine. And that night, I got home like it was really late. I went straight to bed. My heart was so heavy. And I kept my cell phone beside the bed because I really expected a phone call in the middle of the night to come back to the hospital. A senior pastor was out of town, so I was the pastor on point for this particular surgery. And I had the weirdest dream about her. And I was standing beside her hospital bed, and I'm not making this stuff up. I would never do that. But in my dream, I was standing beside her hospital bed, holding her in my arms, saying, breathe. I just need you to breathe. I need you to breathe. And then I would like practice breathing with her. And then I woke up. I checked my phone. I'm like, I hope nothing's happened. There was nothing on my phone. Well, the next morning, I went back to the hospital, and I was sitting talking with the mom, and She's like, we had a rough night. Now, when I woke up and I looked at my phone, I saw what time it was. And it was 3.33. And the mom said, about 3.30, they called us to come to the hospital. And at 3.33, she coded. I'm like, oh, wow. 
I mean, I, I'm not making that up. Another time, one of the pastors in our conference, he had been the bishop's assistant, he'd been a district superintendent, like really, really connected and very well loved. He was diagnosed with colon cancer. He was probably in his, I don't know, late 60s, early 70s. All of his kids were pastors, and so they really valued prayer, so they decided to have a prayer service for him. And he came into, I was at North Morganton, he came into North Morganton and knelt down in front of the altar. And everybody in that room and that space gathered around him and touched him and one another. And you could feel the energy in that space. You could feel it. Two days later, he went to Duke for the surgery. And they walked out like way too early. It was like 45 minutes after the surgery had began and they asked for the family to come into the room. And they all thought he was dead. And when this surgeon, who was a world-renowned surgeon, got in there, there was no tumor. The same, same surgeon who'd been looking at the scans and all that kind of stuff, he got in there, there was nothing. And the gentleman lived another 15 years. I don't know how it works. I know that sometimes there's healing and sometimes there isn't. I, God's not an arbitrary God. The video I'm going to show you in, in three weeks or whatever, it's, it's going to teach us that there's something to be said for the way that we think and positive thinking. But what I do know for sure is God lives in each of us and there is a presence a divine power and energy that is real. It is up to us to receive it. It is up to us to get all the other stuff out of our way so that we can receive it and then to hold on to it because it will see us through the worst things even when they don't end the way that we want them to. The worst things are never the last things. Will you pray with me? Gracious God, your power, your presence, your energy, it's in this space. It's in each of us, and it's not just this hour. It's every breath that we take, God. May we know that assurance so that it can hold us as we go through life and have to deal with amazing things and difficult things. God, thank you for being this divine, loving presence that is for all. Help us receive you. In Christ's holy and resurrected name we pray. Amen. So back um, of six, seven weeks ago, Lane and JT were going through a miscarriage and we were debating whether we were going to tell the church. For one thing, it was going to be hard to come and stand up here the next day and be able to preach and like just act like everything was okay. Uh, Lane and JT were out of town at the time and Lane's like, I think I need you to put it as a prayer request. And she's like, well, I don't know. And then she called back. She said, I need people to pray. Not that it stop or change, but just pray. And then she called me back and she said, I know you sent the email. I haven't looked at my email, but I know you sent it because I feel peace right now. So when people ask you to pray for them, do it. We don't know how it works, but somehow this energy, this connection, the divine that is in us, that is also within them, it's all connected and it holds them and it holds you. Watch for that this week. You'll find it. Go in peace.